Hello, my friend Titi. Have you ever thought why do humans crave fame? The idea of being a celebrity is like having a luxury pass. You can go wherever you want, people will love you, and you can seemingly get whatever you desire. But the question is, how far are you willing to go to achieve that fame and fortune? It's not easy for you to attend. Today we're gonna talk about Mona Fende, a Malaysian pop singer who turned into witchcraft after failing to find fame in her career. And after killing a politician right away, she went on doing plastic surgery to maintain her hold on the spotlight. Let's see what happens. Dalto Idris, a 49-year-old Malaysian politician, pulled himself to his well-known shaman couple, Mona Fende and her husband, who claimed they would help him achieve his goal, which was the position of Menteri Besar of Pahang, which is like the top leader in the government of Malaysian state of Pahang. Usually, the Menteri Besar comes from the party that has the most seats in the Pahang state legislative assembly and he wants that. Also, it was not the first time they invited him for rituals. It happened several times, but today was odd. They said they were going to give him a cleansing bath for his sins to remove, and it would be a crucial step for him. They asked him to come, so he did. But little did he know, he was never going to back alive from this house. And after weeks of his missing, his body parts were discovered in 18 pieces, which was part of those shaman's couple rituals. How does a cleansing soul ritual took his life? What exactly did those couple do to him? Who were those couple exactly? Let's talk about the bomb population case or the murder of Dato Maslan Itris. No Masla was born in January 1st, 1956. Ever since she was a little, she, she has wanted to be a star. The glamorous world of media and showbiz has always attracted her. Starting as a belly dancer, she had prepared all along for this part. Her dream of becoming a singer came true when she met her third husband, Muhammad Noor Afandi. Changing her name to Mona Fende, she managed to release an album named Diana, and her voice suited the era well. Diana. It was something that suits that era or that time. Like in 90s, 80s, she had that kind of voice. With her husband funding, she also managed to appear on a few TV programs as a guest. But things didn't go as planned or they don't go as we planned. She released a few more songs here and there, but that was it. She realized that popularity and fame couldn't be achieved solely through music. Sometimes you need to seek popularity rather than waiting for it to come to you. So she chose a different path, more dark and hidden, but then not really hidden at the same time. Along with her husband, she ventured into a shamanism or witchcraft, if you will, which proved successful, operating under the name of UMNO, which abbreviated to Malaysian Shaman and Traditional Medicine, which was definitely in another life. But regarding she was lying or not, she got what she desired. She gained high-profile customers, earning money by playing with their emotions in the name of spiritual guidance. Moreover, Individuals of all ages come to her with different problems, from our to marry her or him. So she became famous in that community, although showbiz fame remained her ultimate wish. But this is what she can do. Her luck took a turn in 1993 when politician Dalton Muslin Idris, curious about her abilities, sought her help. Visiting her seemingly luxurious house, he was surprised to find a different world inside. In the inside, it was on the other level, like things you see on TV, like smoke, maybe a false skeleton, rituals and all that fake jazz. So fast forward when they finally met. When they met for the first time, she promised to solve his issues and presenting him with a talisman, claiming it belongs to Malaysia's first president, Sakarno, which was definitely not. For what? For luck you know, a lucky charm, which gonna protect him from all the evil spirits trying to block him from what he wanted to get. Alongside with a traditional cap, Songok, which she also claimed that it's belonged to the first president, which was clearly not true. I don't even know why she said that. But yeah, these old things cost him 2.5 million RM, a huge amount for the time, which is like this much in today's US dollars. So you can see, crazy amount of money. But he agreed to pay only 500,000 RM, 
upfront and promised land upon achieving his goals. So he said that he gonna he'll give them like 10 lands that he have after his work done. Like when he gonna get his position, he gonna give them 10 more lands that he had. It said that our shaman couple didn't really like this attitude. But that time they were like, okay, but not really okay. However, on July 1993, they called him over and said it was part of a ritual. They were going to give him a bath and perform some important rituals and stuff. Now this couple apparently had an assistant too, who was 23 years old, Jeremy Hassan, and was also present during the ritual that night. This is what happened in the presence of these three people with Idris that night. Remember, they said it was a ritual to clean his body first. He was told to lay down on the floor, which was weird, but he did as he was told. He was also told to close his eyes. She then placed an orchid flower on his forehead and asked him to wait until money fell. Not from the tree, but apparently from the sky. So he was lying on the ground with his eyes closed in a room, waiting for money to fall. Instead, an axe fell, which was held by Jirami on orders from Mona and her husband and they killed him. After this, it was said that Jeremy then dismembered his body into 18 parts, possibly with the same axe or other tools. Then he was told to bury him in a storeroom near Mona's house in Pang. Moreover, after this ritual, she went and took a bath to remove all blood from her, and they went on living their lives. On the other hand, for Idris' peers and family, it was odd that he was nowhere to be found and not answering his phone. And because he was a prominent figure, this became news all over Malaysia when he failed to come to a meeting the next day. As a result, his colleagues and friends informed the police of his disappearance. Meanwhile, Mona, with all the money, was living her life. It was said she withdrew 300,000 RM from a bank and, and went on living life like nothing really happened. Right after this heinous crime, she went on a shopping spree in Kuala Lumpur, bought a new Mercedes, a lot of gold necklaces and jewelries, furniture, a TV, a video recorder, a kitchen cabinet and appliances and more. One thing to note is that she bought all the items in cash. No credit card was used. On July 15, she had an appointment for plastic surgery around this much for her face, forehead, and nose. On the other hand, the police were searching for Idris and coincidentally, on July 13, 1993, after just 11 days of his murder, the police called Jeremy, their assistant, for an unrelated drug case and questioned him at the Dong police station. That's when he told them everything about the couple and that night. On July 22, they found Maslan's dismembered body which was partially skinned and buried six feet deep in a hole covered with cement in the storeroom of their unfinished house, alongside the equipment used, which were knives and eggs and more. That's when they were charged with Idris' mother with the help of Jeremy and the evidence from Mona's shopping spree and plastic surgery. Soon after their arrest, they were everywhere from newspaper to TV. The shaman couple in their late 30s gained so much attention. Mona was seen wearing expensive clothes with high-value jewelry, with perfect hair, like not a hair out of place. She was given in each trial, smiling, waving to the camera, as if it were some kind of celebrity event. However, she denied all involvement in Idris' murder and said Jeremy did this on his own, out of the blue, without them knowing. On the other hand, Jeremy said that it was them who forced him to do and he just happened to be in their home that night. They were the one who told him what to do. So they were pointing fingers at each other, which authorities didn't really buy, as the police discovered more crimes. For example, the disappearance of five housemates who had worked for Mona in the late 80s. Additionally, a couple with their five-month-old child, who were also Mona's followers. Their dismembered bodies were found in two different sites in Pahang district. Authorities even said later that those bodies were used for human sacrifices for her rituals. Moreover, the police found four glass jars filled with human organs from where Maslan's body was discovered, and more. They still denied everything, but with the help of all eyewitnesses, the plastic surgeon, even the lawyer, 
where Mona's husband claimed to have bought land from Idris right after his mother become strong evidence. When they asked the couple why they didn't inform the police if they didn't really kill him, they said they were too afraid and in shock, so they forgot to do it. They also claimed that they were tortured by authorities. Mona said they pressed her stitches she got from plastic surgery and were forced by authorities to admit what they didn't do, which didn't really help them and it was never really proven, but we don't know. The prosecution claimed that they killed for money and pointed to their extravagant spending. Despite their plea of innocence, they were found guilty by the jury in just 70 minutes, and they were reported to have smiled when the verdict of guilty was delivered by the jury. Appeals were made but ultimately rejected, leading to their execution. Right after this, she said to the media that she was happy and wanted to say thank you to all Malaysians, as if she achieved an award or something. All three were smiling at the camera, enjoying their fame. Either way, it, it seemed like she enjoyed the attention she received. One of her prison officials said that she never talked that much. They said all three of them just kind of accepted their fate. They also declined their favorite meal before execution. On their last day, they talked with their children, Mona's daughter from her first marriage and her two stepsons. They advised them to be good human beings. Finally, on the morning of November 2, 2001, Mona, her husband, Muhammad Afindi, and their assistant, Jurami, were executed by hanging in Kajang prison for the murder of politician Mazlana Dries. A prison official said that they showed no sign of guilt or remorse and were pretty much calm. Another prison official mentioned hearing Mona murmuring the words, Aku Thaki Mati, meaning I'll never die, smiling and calm. So yeah, this was the story of Malaysia's witch killer and pop singer, Mona Fende and her crimes. I think she did what she did, which was of course not justifiable. I mean, she destroyed many lives and got what she deserved at the end anyway. But her children, they were victims too. I guess they were the biggest victim. How hard would it be for them to live like that? After years of execution, one of her stepsons told the media about how difficult their lives are going. All three siblings had to live apart from others because of how hard it was for them, as they were always looked down upon and rejected by society for something they didn't even do. But again, what do you guys think? Let me know in the comment sections and I'll see you guys next week.